I think that one of the, the when you see the information that's been given us today, you know, especially if you're my age and you remember the sort of great trade union fights of the 60s and the 70s, then it's a question of should we be depressed because the influence of the trade unions is diminishing, or should we be optimistic about the level of struggle and the way it's taken on for, off all over the world? Now, I mean, I was I've encountered Marxism because of those struggles of the 70s and the 80s. And I remember what I learned, and I learned that Karl Marx said that as capitalism progresses, you get more and more workers, they learn to organise, and then, you know, ultimately we get stronger and stronger and stronger. And yet we've got a situation where unemployment's going up, where trade unions are becoming, uh, you know, less familiar to people. Now, I think what we have to do is we have to take the core idea of Marx and apply it to the situation we're in. I think it's a situation where we need to be fantastically optimistic. Because the core idea of Marx is that capitalism forces workers to organise. And you think about world capitalism at the minute, people have a fantastic knowledge of struggle across the world. You look at the Occupy movement springing up in city after city after city, the struggle passes across the world far more easy than it ever did in Marx's day. The other thing is that for Marx, the symbol of capitalism was a factory owner. The symbol today is the banker. And when you say bankers are bastards, people across the world don't need a translator to understand what you're saying. We all understand it. And that brings us together much more. And I think, you see, that um, as capitalism creates a system of us and them, I think that it's breaking the way we used to think. And I work in a college. I just want to give you one example of, of, of a man who I hate, but, I, but we all can learn to love in one way. Called together a group of lecturers in his department, and he, he wanted to turn them around because they were failing, they weren't getting the results. So he said to them, I'll let you into a secret. There's a hierarchy in this place. At the top, there's a senior management. And they look after it because it's a company. And then there's the students. They're the customers. At the bottom is you. Your job's on the line, he said to them. Now, these people used to be the defenders of the system. They used to be people who used to think the system was workable. The minute he said that, he explained to them in a nutshell that you have more in common as a lecturer at the college where I work with a bus driver in Iran than you do with the monarchy, the capitalist, the corporate businessmen who were held up to be the saviors of our society. So I think if we take the core of Marxism, capitalism organizes workers to oppose them. I think on a world scale, we have grounds to be optimistic. My name's George Binet, and I'm the secretary of the Camden branch of Unison, uh, which I'm sure, according to Owen's newfound friend, Lord Melvin Bragg, would make me impeccably middle class. But at any rate, Unison is, uh, as everyone here knows, far and away the largest trade union in Britain now, with some 1.3 million members. Most of those members were on strike on 30th of November. I think in a contribution, Cat Boyd, quite rightly, pointed out the rapid demobilization that occurred in the immediate aftermath of November the 30th. And I think what that illustrated is the extent to which the reshaping of the working class, which we've witnessed in this country in particular over the last three decades, combined with the anti-union laws, which are such a key part of the Thatcherite legacy maintained by Blair, Brown, and New Labour, how those factors have combined to strengthen the dead hand of bureaucracy within the trade unions. So the reality of the situation, certainly in local government today, is that the average union member is in his or her mid to late 40s. You know, in sharp contrast, really, to the composition of those in generational terms who are at the forefront of the new social movements to which Adrian referred in his contribution. The question really for us is how we combine, those of us who remain active in the trade unions, the imagination and the energy which we've witnessed over the last decade around the anti-war movement in particular, but also during 
the brief but extraordinarily angry and inspiring student uprising of late 2009-10 with what is still a potentially very, very strong trade union movement in Britain. It still represents, and I emphasize the word represents as opposed to organizes, more than a quarter of the workforce in this country. Dramatically down, yes, from 30 years ago, as Owen quite rightly pointed out, but still a very, very large proportion of the total population, and far and away the biggest organized force of any kind in, quote, civil society, unquote. Now that's a huge challenge, and I don't pretend to have all the answers by any means, but I would point to some very local examples on top of those Owen actually cited in his presentation around the sparks in their fight with a multinational construction giant, Balfour Beatty, and in addition, I can think at the moment of three struggles. One looks very traditional, right? One on the outskirts of Liverpool, you have locked out workers in Bootle who are staging round the clock, 24 hour pickets, seven days a week, locked out by a multinational based in Austria. Second struggle, Carillion. GMB members. 30 seconds. GMB members. 25. Uh, GMB members at Carillion. In Bristol. They have actually embarked this weekend on a seven-day strike over bullying. And finally, NSL members, mainly black African workers. We're all friends. Thanks. Also, can I have this guy here, the guy at the back who's talking to his friend, you're next. And the woman in the stripes, be ready, please. This is scary. <laughs> I'm not used to speaking like this, but, um, and also, George is the leader of my union, <laughs> of my branch as well. So I uh, didn't know he was going to be here, but I'm, I was a single parent. I'm um, an ex social worker who was a agency social worker, therefore. I was part of the precarious employed people. Um, I, I've, uh, since I retired, I've become a governor of my local mental health foundation trust. And in that capacity, I find myself a complete loner in, on the board of governors in trying to save jobs in the Mental Health Trust and also trying to stop the previous Labour leader of the council who is now the leader of the Foundation Trust cutting by 500 jobs, you know, the mental health services. And, you know, I think that if any of you are union members, you should be getting on boards of governors, you should be getting on, you know, anything that has any power like that and try to convert the people there because on this board of governors, for instance, there are 27 people there. They all just follow their leader. They haven't got an opinion, you know, in hell, uh, you know, to save a cat in hell. And if I actually stand up with my lack of experience and say something like, you know, what are you doing here? It actually shames them. And I surprise myself sometimes because just by having the courage to say that, you know, people can actually hold their head in shame and say, yeah, we're wrong. But meanwhile, the cuts are going on. So everybody who's got, a, you know, any chance of applying to be on a board like that should do it. And, I, you know, union membership is okay. I'm a... I'm a member of Unison retired members and in that capacity I've got nothing to lose. I haven't got a job to lose. So, um, you know, I think even when you're unemployed you should be in the union because you can still go on marches, you can still do voluntary work, you can do all the other stuff that people in work can't do. So, you know, that's my contribution. And, you know. The picture that I'm Owen and Kat and uh, Aidy painted is, we've got to be honest, it's a massively changed picture from the one that lots of people on the left got, have. There's kind of the, the caricature of the situation that people, that, that people have. 
And I'd like, I, I'm not gonna do this, but to illustrate that, I would I just, just imagine if everyone who's in this room, who's in a union, put their hand up, uh, and we saw the kind of proportions. And that, in a way, tells, would tell me a story, would visualize it. And um, the point is, I think we have to look at that in both, on both sides. There is a problem. The experience of the 1980s has been, and the 1990s as well, has been lots of defeats, trade, all the things Aitley talked about, trade union density going down, people being unsure about ideas and so on and so forth, and, getting, and being disorganized. On the other hand, you have to look at the upside, because as well as neoliberalism has done all that, but it's also massively radicalized people. There are loads of people who aren't in trade unions who are beginning to say, we have to do something now. Loads of people who aren't in trade unions who are saying, we've got to fight back, we've got to organize, we've got to campaign, we've got to find new ways of protesting. And that's the situation we face. And we have to think strategically about how to work towards making the most of that situation. And, it, and actually, if you look at what's going on in other parts of the world, look at Egypt. It's not the case that the trade unions were at the forefront of that struggle. The trade unions did play a crucial role in bringing down Mubarak in the end. There was a general strike two days before he came down. The trade unions came out after weeks and weeks of mass protests, all sorts of different people in society coming together and saying, we're not gonna take this anymore. To me, that has got to be the pattern, if we're honest. We have to forge movements that involve all the different constituencies who have been radicalised, who are completely pissed off with what is going on, who know that society is unworkable the way it is. We have to create a movement like that that is open to everyone. People feel they can take it on and lead it themselves. And that is a big task. And that's a culture shift for the left. And that's what this event is about. It's what the Coalition of Resistance is about. It's also what Counterfire is about. That's going to be the order. We have to be very, very political as well. The points AD made, he didn't, I've seen his graphs. I'll end on this. I've seen right to the end of his graphs. And I tell you, the, the, the thing that really hits you is the number of things, the, the number of people in British society now who self-define as being on the left. It's gone up in the last 20 or 30 years. It's gone up something like 10%. Now, those people, 10% of society is enough to mobilise a movement that can actually shake the government. And that's the job that we've got to set ourselves. Um, I'm really just going to, I was just going to say mostly what um, Chris just said. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of people, that image will be so far from the idea of the traditional way that the left interacts with society. In that kind of classical socialist schema, you'd want the most fighting elements of society to be the trade unionists, because they'd be organised at the point of production where they can exercise enormous power. That's still the case. You still want that, and it's still going to come about. But there is, there is this thing, this, this situation in capitalist society where the working class is ideologically uneven. You know, Vladimir Lenin used to talk about a vanguard, it's kind of an antiquated term and so on, it's a sort of military term. But what he was saying was, within the, the working class, which is a wide social vector, it's not just people who are actively engaged right now in wage labour in certain industries, heavy industries, in trade unions, etc. It's a very broad social vector. And in that vector there are elements which are the hardest fighting elements, the vanguard. Now, we could wish that that vanguard was the, the organised trade unions. And I believe that one day again it will be, but we have to fight to get to that situation. Who is it at the moment? That's a very simple question to answer. You can always identify who the vanguard is, uh, are of the class at the moment by the people who are getting an absolute tanking from the state, the people who are under really severe attack. Think about how many young people in this country have been processed into the prison system over the last two or so, or, or so years. After London riots, they set up 24-hour kangaroo courts that were processing 18-year-olds into three, four, five-year-long prison terms in five minutes. So much so that the staff in those kangaroo courts started to complain about the, the fact that we're just processing an entire generation of young radical people. I'm not saying all of them. Uh, you know, are, are all that left wing and so on, but there were people who were actively engaged in an angry expression against the system. I know that a lot of, uh, you know, public property was damaged and so on. I'm not saying everything that came out of that riot was wonderful. However, that's their general approach to young people. If you look at the reaction to Milbank, the number of students who've been incarcerated, 
And they, they specifically try to identify the organizers, the people who started building things on their campuses. They researched these people, hunted them down, and arrested them. Can you imagine the stink the left would have made out of this if it was organized trade unionists? I think that's a problem we have to identify, and we have to say when the most forward element of our class at the moment is getting an absolute tanking, we have to defend them. It's a black and white issue when it is striking workers being chucked in the back of police vans and hauled off to prison. We have to be just as angry about what they're doing to youth in this country, arresting them and so on, as we would be if it was trade unionists. I just really want to add to what um, Owen Jones said before about the uh, new unionism, because I think it's very important to um, remember that movement, because Engels made a particular point about it in 1894 when he rewrote or updated the uh, conditions of the working class that Marx had written. And uh, it was really the result of um, a lot of activity in the East End with the um, particularly the, the uh, Jewish, I'm sorry I've got stage fright a bit, I'll just <laughs> pause for a moment. It really began because um, a lot of people were getting very upset about the condition of the sweaters in the East End and the unemployed. And the unemployed went on a march in 1886 and they started to break windows and the police were completely thrown and they didn't really deal with it very well, the police. So in 1887, William Morris was on the march with uh, quite a few of the trade unionists at the time, like Burns and uh, uh, Collingswood, I think was his name, the other one, and Eleanor, Eleanor Marks as well. And they'd um, had a terrible experience, Bloody Sunday, when they'd gone to Trafalgar Square, and it had been a bit like Tahir Square, because a lot of the people were unemployed, a lot of the people were very, very new to unionism, a lot of the people couldn't get unionised, they were unemployed dockers, basically, who couldn't get work. And um, it was put down with the utmost ferocity by the ruling class that they actually sent in their troops. And um, they killed people, they killed several people, and they also um, injured thousands that were on that, uh, in Tra Trafalgar Square. And they learned a lot from that. William Morris learned a lot. I mean, it was really quite a, a, a badly organized event, basically. So in some, yeah. So just leaping forward to the Match Girls strike, they weren't going to have that. It was 1888. And um, the match girls were helped by Eleanor Marx and Eleanor Besant to struggle and organize and get success. And it was that success that did everything. A small group of people in, the, in Bow uh, sort of set the land on fire. There'd been lots of activity in Bradford. There'd been lots of activity in Scotland. Keir Hardy was at it. But when the... Um, the people started to get unionised uh, as a result of the Match Girls strike. Yeah, Apart from the traditional union, uh, unions, then that changed everything. And um, 200,000 successful workers came on the, um, the big strike, the dock strike, the great dock strike of 1889. And that led to everything. <laughs>